Chapter 38, Fundamentals, End of Life Care. Define terminal illness, name the five stages of dying, describe two methods by which nurses can promote the acceptance of death in dying clients, define respite care, discuss the philosophy of hospice care, list at least five aspects of terminal care, name at least five signs of multiple organ failure, Explain why a discussion of organ donation must take place as expeditiously as possible following a client's death. Name three components of post-mortem care. Explain the difference between a clinical autopsy and a forensic autopsy and the manner in which post-mortem care is implemented. Discuss the benefit of grieving and one sign that grief is being resolved. In the U.S., life expectancy continues to increase to a current average of 78.8 years based on the declining number of deaths. Nevertheless, death remains a certainty for all people. The only unknowns are when, where, and how it will occur. Older adults may read obituaries and death notices in the newspaper daily in an effort to keep up with acquaintances. Although this activity may be viewed as potentially depressing, it may be an effective coping mechanism in helping to develop a peaceful and accepting attitude toward death. Nurses and other health care providers are probably more involved than any other group with people who experience impending death. This chapter deals with aspects of caring for terminally ill patients and the grieving process for all those involved in the dying process. A terminal illness means a condition from which recovery is beyond a reasonable expectation. Such a diagnosis is devastating news. On learning that death is imminent, clients tend to experience several stages as they process the information. Stages of Dying Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, in 1969, a psychiatrist and authority on death and dying, described the five stages of grief. It's called the Kubler-Ross model for many terminally ill clients' progress. They are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These stages, which represent a pattern of adjustment, may occur in progressive fashion or a person can move back and forth through the stages. There is no specific time period for the rate of progression, duration, or completion of the stages. Denial. Denial, the psychological defense mechanism by which a person refuses to believe certain information helps people to cope initially with the reality of death. Terminally ill clients may first refuse to believe that their diagnosis is accurate. They may speculate that test results are wrong or that the reports have been confused with those of others. Stages of Dying Stages of Dying Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, 1969, a psychiatrist and authority on death and dying, described the five stages of grief the Kubler-Ross model for many terminally ill clients' progress. They are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These stages, which represent a pattern of adjustment, may occur in a progressive fashion or a person can move back and forth through the stages. There's no specific time period for the rate of progression, duration, or completion of the stages. Denial, the psychological defense mechanism by which a person refuses to believe certain information, helps people to cope initially with the reality of death. Terminally ill clients may first receive to refuse to believe that their diagnosis is accurate. They may speculate that the test results are wrong or that their reports have been confused with those of others. Anger. Anger is the emotional response to feeling victimized. It occurs because there is no way to retaliate against fate. Clients often displace their anger onto nurses, physicians, family members, even God. They may express anger in less than obvious ways, for example, by complaining about care or overreacting to even the slightest annoyances. Bargaining. A psychological mechanism for delaying the inevitable involves a process of negotiation, usually with God or some other higher power. Usually dying clients have come to terms with their death, but want to extend their lives temporarily until some significant event takes place, such as a child's wedding. Depression. Depression is a deeply sad mood, indicates the realization that death will come sooner rather than later. The sad mood is a result of confronting potential losses.
Kubler-Ross describes unfinished business in two ways. Literally, it refers to completing legal and financial matters to provide the best security for survivors. It also refers to addressing social and spiritual matters, such as saying goodbye to loved ones and making peace with God. It is as important for dying clients as it is for their families to say thank you for and I'm sorry for. After tying up all loose ends, dying clients feel prepared to die. Some even happily anticipate death, viewing it as a bridge to a better dimension. Promoting acceptance. Nurses can help clients to pass from one stage to another by prov providing emotional support and by supporting the client's choices concerning terminal care. Facilitating the client's directives helps to maintain the client's personal dignity and focus of control. Emotional support. Emotional support is always part of nursing care. However, it may be necessary for dying clients more th so than in any other situation. Sometimes a dying client simply wants an opportunity to express his or her feelings and verbally work through emotions. Nurses can act as non-judgmental sounding boards in such instances. In addition to being available for conversation, nurses provide emotional support to dying clients by acknowledging them as unique and worthwhile. Dying with dignity means the process by which the nurse cares for dying patients with respect no matter what their emotional, physical, or cognitive state. This process reflects the concepts stated in the Dying Patients Bill of Rights. Gerontological Considerations Include all older adults as well as others who are dying in as many aspects of care and decision making as possible. The emphasis is on maintaining self esteem and personal dignity. Clients of all ages may feel that the use of machines and equipment designed to maintain the life support threatens their dignity. Death is a very individualized experience that is highly influenced by many factors, including prior experiences, cultural practices, religious beliefs, and level of personal development. Many older adults are realistically aware of their pending and inevitable death. Often they are relieved to find when healthcare providers are comfortable discussing death with them. Older adults may benefit from counseling regarding end-of-life concerns, especially if they have a history of accepting help in coping with challenging issues. Is the following statement true or false? Acceptance occurs while clients deal with their losses and are completing unfinished business. False. Acceptance occurs after clients have dealt with their losses and completed unfinished business. Promoting acceptance continued. Emotional support is always part of nursing care. However, it may be more necessary for dying clients than in any other situation. Sometimes the dying client simply wants an opportunity to express his or her feelings and verbally work through emotions. Nurses can act as non-judgmental sounding boards in such instances. In addition to being available for conversation, nurses provide emotional support to dying clients by acknowledging them as unique and worthwhile. Dying with dignity means the process by which the nurse cares for dying clients with respect, no matter what their emotional, physical, or cognitive state. This process reflects the concepts stated in the Dying Patients Bill of Rights. Box 38.1, The Dying Person's Bill of Rights. I have the right to be treated as a living human being until I die. I have the right to maintain a sense of hopefulness, however changing its focus may be. I have the right to be cared for by those who maintain a sense of hopelessness, of hopefulness, however changing this might be. I have the right to express my feelings and emotions about my approaching death in my own way. I have the right to participate in decisions concerning my care. I have the right to expect continuing medical and nursing attention, even though cure goals must be changed to comfort goals. I have the right not to die alone. I have the right to be free from pain. I have the right to have my questions answered honestly. I have the right not to be deceived. 
I have the right to have help from and for my family in accepting my death. I have the right to die in peace and dignity. I have the right to retain my individuality and not be judged for my decisions, which may be contrary to the beliefs of others. I have the right to discuss and enlarge my religious and or spiritual experiences, whatever these may mean to others. I have the right to expect that the sanctity of the human body will be respected after death. I have the right to be cared for by caring, sensitive, knowledgeable people who will attempt to understand my needs and will be able to gain some satisfaction in helping me face my death. Emotional support is always part of nursing care. However, it may be more necessary for dying clients than in any other situation. And in arrangements for care, respecting the rights of dying clients includes helping them to choose how and where they want to receive terminal care. Clients may find it comforting to prepare an advanced directive. See Chapter 3. Many also appreciate learning about available settings for care. In general, clients have four choices. Home care, hospice care, which may be the same as home care residential care, and acute care. Home care. Many clients with a terminal illness remain at home. They may travel to and from a hospital or clinic for brief treatments, tests, and medical evaluations. Nurses may help to coordinate community services, secure home equipment, and arrange for home nursing visits. Because the major burden of home care often falls on a spouse, family member, or significant other, nurses who care for homebound clients periodically assess the toll this burden takes on the primary caregiver. The focus of support may shift back and forth from the client to the caregiver. Respite care is relief for the caregiver by a surrogate. It is important because it gives the caregiver an opportunity to enjoy brief periods away from home. Nurses can encourage the caregiver to identify relatives or friends who will volunteer relief time with the client. If no one is available, the short-term respite care can be arranged in an inpatient facility, hospital, or nursing home for up to five days each time. Inpatient respite care pays 95% of the Medicare-approved amount. Nursing Guidelines 38.1, Helping Dying Clients Cope. Accept the client's behavior no matter what it is. Doing so demonstrates respect for all individuality. Provide opportunities for the client to express feelings freely. Giving such opportunities demonstrates an attention to meeting individual needs. Try to understand the client's feelings. Understanding reinforces the client's uniqueness. Use statements with broad openings such as, it must be difficult for you, and do you want to talk about it? Such language encourages communication and allows the client to choose the topic or manner of response. Hospice and palliative care. The term hospice is used to indicate both a facility for providing the care of terminally ill clients and the concept of such care itself. The word originally derives from a place of refuge for travelers. Today's hospice movement is modeled after facilities established by Dr. Cicely Saunders in England in the late 1960s. The movement spread to the U.S. in the 1970s. The National Hospice Organization, now known as the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, was formed in 1978. Palliative care involves providing relief from distressing symptoms, easing pain, and enhancing quality of life. In 1983, the U.S. Congress adopted the Medicare Hospice Benefits Program to provide funds for hospice care. Hospice care involves helping clients to live their final days in comfort, with dignity, and an, in a caring environment. To support hospice goals, healthcare providers may suggest simplifying drug administration by the compounding of drugs. A drug given by the oral parenteral route may be mixed with an agent and administered topically with the intent of systemic absorption. Eligibility for hospice care. In general, clients with six months or less to live as certified by a physician are accepted for hospice care in the U.S. If a client survives for beyond six months, he or she continues to receive care as long as the physician certifies that the client continues to meet hospice criteria. 
While receiving hospice care, the client must accept palliative comfort care instead of care to cure the terminal illness. Palliative care uses medications to manage many of the symptoms experienced during the dying process. Pharmacologic symptom management treats pain, breathlessness, fatigue, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, constipation, anxiety, depression, dry mouth, and sleep disturbances. Hospice services. Many hospice clients receive care in their own homes. A multidisciplinary team of hospice professionals and volunteers supports care given by the family. Hospice organizations also provide support programs for family members and significant others. They offer individual and group counseling both during and after the client's death to help survivors cope with grief. Medicare Home Hospice Benefits Hospice, nurse, and physician on call 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. A hospice aid and homemaker services, medications for symptom control or pain relief, medical supplies and equipment, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech-language pathology services, social work and counseling services for clients and caregivers, dietary counseling services, short-term respite care, short-term inpatient care, for pain and symptom management, grief and loss counseling for client and family, any other Medicare covered services need to manage pain and other symptoms as recommended by the hospice team. Gerontologic considerations. Hospice services should be considered for older adults with chronic life limiting conditions such as dementia or heart failure. Often families and older adults are relieved Often families and older adults are relieved when providers discuss hospice care so that they can be involved in choices about the type of care they receive. Nurses can encourage older adults and their families to explore these resources because they may benefit from the hospice approach to care, which includes a wide range of support services. Terminating hospice care. Hospice services can be terminated when a client's health improves, the client's illness goes into remission, or the client withdraws for any reason. Once hospice care is terminated, care can be provided under the client's original Medicare coverage. However, the client can apply for hospice care at any time if circumstances change. Is the following statement tr <clears throat> true or false? In home care, the focus of support may shift back and forth from the client to the caregiver. This is true. In home care, the focus of support may shift back and forth from the client to the caregiver. This answer is true. In home care, the focus of support may shift back and forth from the client to the caregiver. Arrangements for care. Many hospice clients receive care in their own homes. A multidisciplinary team of hospice professionals and volunteers support care given by the family. Hospice organizations can provide support programs for family members and significant others. They offer individual and group counseling both during and after the client's death to help survivors cope with grief. Terminating hospice care can be terminated when a client's health improves, the client's illness goes into remission, or the client withdraws for any reason. Once hospice care is terminated, care can be provided under the client's original Medicare coverage. However, the client can apply for hospice care at any time if circumstances change. Residential care is a form of intermediate care. Nursing homes or long-term care facilities are the usual setting for long-term subacute care. These facilities provide round-the-clock nursing care for clients who cannot live independently. Family members have peace of mind knowing that their loved one is receiving care and they enjoy the opportunity to visit as much as possible. Such care, however, is costly. 
Long-term care insurance helps people with chronic illnesses, disabilities, or other conditions with daily needs such as simple activities to skilled care over an extended period of time when the need becomes necessary. However, there are many variations in policies among different insurers, some of whom have a history of charging policyholders with premium increases. Acute care. A client needs acute care with sophisticated technology and labor-intensive treatment if his or her condition is unstable. This form of care is most expensive. Expenses for acute care provided in the hours, days, or weeks before a client's death can be significant. Most prefer to die at home. However, fewer than 25% actually do. Many in terminal stages of a life-threatening illness die in settings where the focus is on curing and, pro and prolonging life. There is a potential that clients who are hospitalized may be subjected to non-beneficial invasive treatments and medical treatments. Providing terminal care. Throughout terminal care and immediately before a client's death, nurses must meet his or her basic physical needs for hydration, nourishment, elimination, hygiene, positioning, and comfort. Nurses implement many of the skills described throughout this text to meet the multiple problems that the dying clients experience. Nurses have important roles in teaching older adults about advanced directives concerning their health care and identifying a person with a durable power of health care at the same time they prepare a will. See Chapter 3. These advanced directives must be reviewed and updated periodically and should be accessible to all those involved in care. Hydration. Hydration involves the maintenance of an adequate fluid volume. If the client's swallowing reflex remains intact, the nurse offers water, water and other beverages frequently. As swallowing becomes impaired, the client is at risk for aspiration, followed by pneumonia. Sucking is one of the last reflexes to disappear as death approaches. Therefore, the nurse can provide a moist cloth or wrapped ice cubes for the client to suck. Some are of the opinion that avoiding parenteral fluids and allowing dehydration for someone who is actively dying may be beneficial. It may relieve choking, less chest congestion, decrease urine output, and reduce vomiting and diarrhea. Nourishment. Some terminally ill clients have little interest in eating. The effort may be too exhausting or nausea and vomiting may result. Poor nutrition can lead to weakness, infection, and other complications such as pressure sores. A full liquid diet may be an alternative approach to solid foods. Nausea may be controlled with rectal medications like plochlorazamine, which is compazine, or ondansetron, which is zofran, administered subcutaneously. There is strong clinical, ethical, and legal support both for and against artificial nutrition and hydration when it is not clear what the individual wants or what is clinically warranted. While nutrition and hydration can maintain life by themselves, they cannot prevent imminent death. The decision to provide, withdraw, or withhold artificial nutrition and hydration includes consideration for a protecting right to life, not unnecessarily prolonging suffering, and the individual's family's preference. Elimination. Some terminally ill clients are incontinent of urine and stool. Others experience urinary retention and constipation. All these conditions are uncomfortable. A physician may order cleansing enemas or suppositories. Catheterization also may be necessary. Skin care becomes particularly important for incontinent clients because urine and stool left in contact with the skin contribute to skin break breakdown and produce foul odors. If urinary or bowel incontinence is minimal, it can be managed with absorbent pads. Hygiene. The dignity of clients is largely related to their personal appearance. Therefore, nurses strive to keep clients clean, well-groomed, and free of unpleasant odors. Frequent mouth care may be necessary. Oral suctioning helps to remove mucus and saliva that the client cannot swallow or expectorate. A lateral position keeps the mouth and throat free of accumulating secretions. 
The lips may need periodic lubrication because they become dried from mouth breathing or the administration of oxygen. A scopolamine transdermal patch, when ordered by the physician, may be applied and changed every 72 hours or subcutaneous administration of Robinol may reduce oral secretions when the client is disturbed by coughing spells that interfere with sleep or worsen dyspnea. Positioning. The lateral position helps to prevent choking and aspiration. Nevertheless, the nurse may raise the client's head to improve breathing and change the client's position at least every two hours as for any other client to promote comfort and circulation. Breathlessness. For clients who experience shortness of breath, a nurse can place the client in a high Fowler's position and keep activity to a minimum. Oxygen per nasal cannula rather than a face mask is preferable so as not to avoid interfering with communication, taking oral foods and fluids, or causing distress. At home, a window may be opened. Some find relief when a fan is used to blow air toward the face. Comfort. Relieving pain may be the most challenging problems when dying patients are cared for. The goal is to keep clients free from pain, but not to dull consciousness, suppress respirations, or the inability to communicate. Most clients initially receive non-opioids for pain. Later, the physician may change the drug to order a combination of non-opioid and opioid analgesics, or eventually a potent opioid. He or she may also change the route from oral to parenteral to transdermal. Analgesia may be more effective when the client receives the drug on a routine schedule. Giving pain medications regularly, such as every four hours, or by continuous release through a transdermal patch, rather than on an ad-needed basis, maintains a consistent level of pain relief. The dosage will probably need to be increased because of drug tolerance. Fear of addiction should not interfere with efforts to relieve pain. Statistics indicate that the fear of addiction is greater than the reality. The frequency of addiction is previously in previously non-drug abusing clients is rare. Unfortunately, nurses and physicians often misinterpret increased requests for pain medication as evidence of addiction. In reality, an increased desire for pain medication may be the result of the development of drug tolerance or an increase in pain related to the disease progression. Clients develop tolerance to the pain relieving property of analgesic drugs. However, clients who are tolerant to opioids concomitantly develop resistance to respiratory depression, a common side effect of narcotic analgesics. Sedation generally precedes respiratory depression. As long as the client is alert, the potential for respiratory depression is minimum. Opioid antagonists can be given for severe respiratory depression should it develop, but the dosage must be reduced to avoid producing withdrawal symptoms and eliminating the desired analgesic state. Constipation may be more common among those using continuous opioid analgesia. Drugs such as Movantic and Amitza and others are used to manage opioid-induced constipation. Constipation that leads to the potential for obstruction is an uncomfortable side effect of opioid treatment in the severely ill. Typically, laxatives are used to prevent this condition. Relistor is the first drug of its kind which blocks the opioid binding specifically on gastrointestinal tract receptors. Clients need to be monitored for opioid withdrawal symptoms when taking this drug. People ages 45 to 64 have the highest rate of completing an act of suicide. Those 85 years and older have the second highest rate. SPAN in 2013 suggests this is due to the inability to recognize signs of depression in older adults. Antidepressant therapy can be successful in this population, yet assessment can be difficult when depressive symptoms are not recognized. Lack of interest or lacking the appearance of sadness are two reasons older adults are not diagnosed as depressed and recommended antidepressant treatment. Family involvement. Family members may appreciate involvement in the client's care because they often feel helpless. Involvement tends to maintain family bonds and help survivors to cope with future grief. Many welcome the opportunity to assist. Nevertheless, nurses should not burden family members with major responsibilities. 
Some terminally ill clients forestall dying when they feel that their loved ones are not yet prepared to deal with their death. This has been described as the waiting for permission phenomena because death often occurs shortly after a significant family member communicates that he or she is strong enough and ready to let go. Nurses must support family members at this time because family members may feel as though they have given up and let down their loved one. Approaching death. As death nears, the client exhibits signs indicating a decrease, then ultimately a cessation of function. As these signs appear, the nurse informs the client's family that death is approaching. Multiple organ failure. The signs of approaching death are the result of multiple organ failure, a condition in which two or more organ systems gradually cease to function, which directly relates to the quality of cellular oxygenation. When the supply of oxygen begins to fall below levels required to sustain life, cells followed by tissues and organs begin to deteriorate. The cardiovascular, pulmonic, hepatic, and renal systems are most vulnerable to failure. As they cease to function, cells release their intracellular chemicals. Pre-existing hypoxia is first complicated by a localized rather than a generalized inflammatory response that causes the signs of multiple organ failure, heralding approaching death. See Table 38.2. This process may take place gradually over hours or days. Signs of multiple organ failure. Heart, hypotension, irregular weak and rapid pulse, cold, clammy, and mottled skin. Liver, internal bleeding, edema, jaundice, and impaired digestion, distension, anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Lungs, dyspnea, and accumulation of fluid called the death rattle. Kidneys, oliguria, and anturia. Puritis, itching skin. Brain, fever, confusion and disorientation, hypoesthesia, which is reduced sensation, hyporeflexia, which is re reduced reflexes, stupor, and coma. Family notification. As the client shows signs of impending death, the nurse must make the family aware that the end is near. If the client is in a hospital or extended care facility, the nurse informs the physician first. The, physicians is, the physician is responsible for contacting the family and releasing that information. Sometimes the physician delays the news until he or she can talk with the family in person to avoid precipitating acts such as suicide or contributing to a traffic accident. Summoning the family of a client. Diet. client. Plan to notify the family in a timely manner. Check the client's medical record for the next of skin or kin or a responsible party. Identify yourself by name, title, and location. Ask for the family member by name. Speak in a calm and controlled voice. Use short sentences to provide small bits of information. Explain that the client's condition is deteriorating. Pause after giving the most important information. Give brief answers to questions. Emphasize the level of care that the client is receiving. Urge family members to come as soon as possible. Document the time, the person to whom you communicated the information, and the message. Is the following statement true or false? Hospice services can be terminated if the client does not meet the Medicare criteria. This is true. Hospice services can be terminated if the client does not meet the Medicare criteria. Discussing organ and tissue donation. Virtually anyone from the very young to older adults may be an organ donor. If the donor is younger than 18 years of age, he or she must sign a donor card along with the parents or legal guardian. Age requirements and organ acceptance are determined on an individual basis at the time of death and organ procurement. Some people have the foresight to communicate whether they are interested in organ donation, others do not. In other cases, or either case, if the dying or dead client meets the donation criteria, the possibility of harvesting organs is considered. Organ donation may or may not be discussed with the next of kin based on guidelines in the 2009 revision of the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. 
If a dying or deceased person has a document identifying an intention to donate organs or has expressly refused organ donation, the next of kin or someone with the power of attorney for health care need not be involved. If no documentation of intent is available, consent for organ donation on behalf of the client can be sought. Finally, without a signed refusal, life support may not be withdrawn until the potential for organ donation is determined, even if doing so contradicts a person's advanced directives, because life support that has the potential to save lives overrides the desire to withhold or withdraw life support. Involving the next of kin or the person with the power of attorney for health care concerning organ donation is generally a courtesy even when it is not absolutely required. This is done delicately by an organ procurement officer. This person is trained in techniques for sensitively requesting organ donations from family members grieving the death of a loved one. The health care agency selects the person who will solicit organ donations. Typically, the facility's transplant coordinator is the organ procurement officer. Solicitation for organ donation cannot be delayed. Some organs such as heart and lungs must be harvested within a few hours to ensure a successful transplant. In some cases, the client is kept on life support before removing organs. To protect the health care facility from any legal consequences, permission may be obtained in writing. Confirming death. Death is generally determined on the basis that breathing and circulation have ceased. In most cases, when these criteria are met, there is no question that the person is dead. Legally, a physician, a physician's assistant, or a medical examiner, or a coroner is responsible for pronouncing a client dead. In 20 states, nurses are authorized to do so. Brain death. In some situations involving irreversible brain damage, a mechanical ventilator can sustain breathing and circulation that continues reflexively. In 1968, the Ad Hoc Committee of the Harvard Medical School released a report on the definition of brain death, a condition in which there is an irreversible loss of function of the whole brain, including the brain stem. Their recommendations served as the basis for the Uniform Definition of Death Act. Consequently, an irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or a cessation of all brain functions is now considered the most incontestable criterion for establishing whether a person is dead or alive. Based on guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology in 2010, irreversible brain death is considered to be present if, in the absence of hypothermia, central nervous system depressants, or conditions that may stimulate brain death, when there is a lack of evidence of responsiveness, absence of brainstem reflexes such as pupillary reflexes in both eyes, ocular movements, corneal reflex, facial mu muscle movement to noxious stimuli, pharyngeal and tra tracheal reflexes, absence of breathing drive based on disconnection from the ventilator, no respiratory movements for 8 to 10 minutes, and repeated again for 10 to 15 minutes after being adequately pre-oxygenated. Following the determination of how of the brain death, an organ procurement organization is contacted. If the deceased has not provided evidence of a desire for organ donation or the next of kin refuses, the physician issues a death certificate and obtains written permission for an autopsy if one is desirable. Death certificate. A death certificate, a legal document attesting that the person named on the form has been found dead, also indicates the presumptive cause of the person's death. Death certificates are sent to local health departments that use the information to compile mortality statistics. The statistics are important in identifying trends, needs, and problems in the fields of health and medicine. The mortician, the person who who prepares the body for burial or cremation is responsible for filling the death certificate with the proper authorities. The death certificate also carries the mortician's signature and in some states his or her license number. Permission for autopsy. A clinical autopsy is an examination of the organs and tissues of a human body after death. It is not necessary after all deaths, but is useful for determining more conclusively the cause of death. The findings may affect the medical care of blood relatives who may be at risk for a similar disorder, or the results may contribute to medical science. It is usually the physician's responsibility to obtain permission for an autopsy. 
Deaths that are seemingly unnatural or suspicious may fall under the jurisdiction of a medical examiner, a physician who has specialized training in forensic pathology. Instead of a medical examiner, there may be a coroner, a public official who does not necessarily have a medical background. Both have legal authority to investigate deaths that may not be the result of natural causes and order a forensic autopsy to investigate a death. A forensic autopsy is a medi medical legal examination to determine if a crime has been committed. A forensic autopsy does not require permission from the next of kin. Examples of deaths reportable to a medical examiner. Sudden while in, in apparent good health. Criminally violent, such as a homicide, suicide suspicious, or in unusual circumstances. While in police custody, while in prison, criminal, criminal abortion, potential threat to public health. Performing postmortem care. Postmortem care is care of the body after death involves cleaning and preparing the body to enhance its appearance during viewing at the funeral home, ensuring proper identification and releasing the body to mortuary personnel. Deaths that are seemingly natural or unnatural, excuse me, unnatural or suspicious generally involve an examination of the external and internal components of the body. Consequently, intravenous needles and lines, endotracheal, GI tubes, drains, and airways must remain with the body. They should be firmly taped or secured to avoid the risk of leaking or injuring the examiner. The body is not washed, even if soiled or bloody, to remove evidence. Clinical autopsy is an examination of the organs and tissues of a human body after death. It is not necessary after all deaths, but is useful for determining more conclusively the cause of death. Forensic autopsy is a medical legal examination to determine if a crime has been committed. A forensic autopsy does not require permission from the next of kin. Grieving. Grieving means the process of feeling acute sorrow over a loss. It is a painful experience, but it helps survivors to resolve the loss. Some people experience anticipatory grieving or grieving that begins after the loss occurs. The longer people have to anticipate a loss, the sooner they eventually resolve it. Grief, work, activities involved in grieving includes participating in the burial rituals common to a culture. Although such rituals differ, the grief response, the psychological and physical phenomena experienced by those grieving is universal. Psychological reactions are commonly identified as the stages of grief. Shock and disbelief, the refusal to accept that a loved one is about to die or has died. Developing awareness, the physical and emotional responses such as feeling sick, sad, empty, or angry. Restitution period, a recognition of the loss. Idealization, an exaggeration of the good qualities of the deceased. Some survivors may say they have paranormal experiences, experiences outside scientific explanation, such as seeing, hearing, or feeling the continued presence of the deceased. The nurse needs to be supportive and not judgmental of the survivor, validating the individual's beliefs. Survivors feel physical symptoms more acutely immediately after the death of a loved one. Some grieving people report symptoms such as anorexia, tightness in the chest and throat, difficulty breathing, lack of strength, and sleep disturbances. No identifiable pathologic state other than grief can explain these symptoms. Gerontological considerations. It is not uncommon for people to develop life-threatening illnesses and die within six months of the death of a spouse. Encouraging older adults who have experienced the death of a close friend or family member to express feelings associated with grieving is important. Referrals for individual counseling with uh, grief support groups are appropriate. Pathologic grief. In pathologic grief, also called dysfunctional grief, a person cannot accept someone's death. Sometimes people manifest pathologic grief by bizarre or morbid behaviors. For example, survivors may keep the possessions of a deceased loved one exactly as they were at the time of death for a pro prolonged period. 
Others may attempt to contact the deceased through seances. In rare instances, survivors may keep a corpse in the home for an extended period after death. Resolution of grief. Mourning takes longer for some than for others. There is no standard length of time for normal grieving. One sign that a person is resolving his or her grief is an ability to talk about the dead person without becoming emotionally overwhelmed. Another sign is that the grieving person describes the good and bad qualities of the deceased. Nurses who care for dying clients, their family members, and their friends might identify many different nursing diagnoses. Acute or chronic pain, chronic pain syndrome, fear, spiritual distress, social isolation, ineffective role performance, interrupted family processes, ineffective coping, disabled family coping, decisional conflict, hopelessness, powerlessness, grieving, complicated grieving, caregiver role strain, death anxiety, and chronic sorrow. This is the end of the slideshow.